Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of Triple SRC Speaks with the topic of preserving mental health during the pandemic. My name is Ivan and I'm your moderator for tonight. So the COVID-19 pandemic has had a major effect on our lives. Many of us are facing challenges that can be stressful, overwhelming and cause strong emotions in adults and children. Public health actions such as social distancing are necessary to reduce the spread of COVID-19 but they can make us feel isolated and lonely and can increase stress and anxiety. So learning to cope with stress in a healthy way will make you, the people you care about and those around you become more resilient. So tonight we are talking with some experts who will speak to the, who speak to the problems that are faced by those of us who are pretty much confined to our homes these days. Things like anxiety, depression, even substance use or overeating. So without further ado, it's time to meet the panelists. So for our first panelist, is, he is a Malaysian politician and, and currently a member of parliament for the Banda Kuching constituency. Concurrently, he chairs the Health, Science and Innovation Select Committee and sits on the Budget Select Committee. He obtained his Doctor of Medicine degree from Volgograd State Medical University in Volgograd, Russia. He is none other than YB Dr. Kelvin Yee. Why don't you say hi, YB? Hi, Ivan. Thank you guys for having me and uh, hi to my fellow very, very distinguished panelists. All right. So for our second panelist, he is a psychiatrist at Sarawak General Hospital. Uh, his career in psychiatry and mental health started in 2010 as a medical officer in a psychiatric hospital in Sabah. He furthered his interest in psychiatry in, to, in 2012, uh, obtained master in psychology med psychological med medicine under university uh, Malaya. His journey as a specialist in mental health started in Laban Hospital and he is actively promoting mental health at the workplace through various programs with government and non-government agencies. He is currently pursuing in child and adolescent psychiatry as his sub-speciality. He believes that mental health starts from young. He is Dr. Ang Boon Seng. Say hi doc. Hi everyone. Good evening. Hope to have a great session with you all. That's it. Evan. All right, thank you, Doc. And last but not least, our third panelist is a clinical psychologist with the Ministry of Health. She obtained her Bachelor of Psychological Science from the University of Queensland, Australia in 2012 and completed her Master of Clinical Psychology from UKM in 2015. Her clinical experiences include conducting psychological assessments, providing psychotherapy and interventions for, for patients across the lifespan ranging from early childhood to geriatric populations. She is also trained in helping individuals manage chronic pain and attends to palliative patients as well. She was in private practice before joining the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at Hospital Tuan Kur Jafa in Seremban in 2017. She is currently working at the Department of Psychiatry and Mental Health at SGH as of March 2021. She is Ms. Charlene Tio. Say hi, Miss. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so happy to be here. And also, thank you for having me. Thank you for that wonderful uh, greeting. Um, OK, so um, without further ado, let's just jump into the questions. So for everyone here, um, let's start with uh, Dr. Kelvin Yi. So doctor, um, for your first question, this is a very general question. So how do pandemics in general um, affect our mental health? Well, I think uh, it's a good question, Ivan, and thank you so much again for having me. I think uh, we, you and I, we all experience a whole new, new experience, especially during this COVID-19, where I think uh, we, are, we are kind of uh, new to this whole experience, and it somehow affects us in, in a lot of ways. I think not just the fear of getting the COVID-19, the fear of, I mean, uh, uh, getting it when we go out to the market, or even severe lockdown measures have, of course, uh, increased feelings of I mean, loneliness. Sometimes we get restless, sometimes we get anxious. And you see many people uh, have been losing their, their jobs, have been losing their income. And of course, this caused people to adapt to new realities and this and, and, and this actually, this change is, is very difficult for a lot of people and this all affects our mental health. I think studies after studies have shown how um, the impact on COVID-19 
exacerbate what is already a growing uh, silent pandemic in not just in our country but around the world. I mean, I can give you statistics. Uh, just recently, actually, uh, something very concerning. I think the 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 Bukit Aman Criminal Investigation Unit uh, CID director uh, released a report that says that this year itself there were four hundred and sixty eight suicides in Malaysia for the first five months. Uh, up from an annual total of 631 cases last year and 609 in 2019. So this actually means right, that three deaths by suicide occurred nationwide daily on average this year up to May. And this is, of course, due to economic devastations, lockdowns due to COVID-19 surge. Uh, and of course, this has doubled uh, the 1.7 rate last year in 2019. And uh, I mean, recently there was a, a research by University of Malaya that I went I come across, and it, it actually shows, it actually said that there is an escalating progression of mental health disorders during COVID nineteen pandemic, and this showed a consistent increase in prevalence of depressive anxiety, stress symptoms across, I mean, across the MCOs in Malaysia. And the highest rate of depressive and anxiety symptoms was at fifty nine point two percent and 55.1% respectively in August and September 2020. I think the Malaysian uh, Mental Health Association, MMHA, uh, even in recorded a two-fold increase in people seeking help um, related to stress in throughout 2020 compared to 2029. So imagine this year, uh, it, it may be even higher due to the, the, the surge of cases. So I mean, in 2020, Befrienders received uh, uh, in, sorry, one in three calls that, that befrienders received were suicidal in nature. And this is compared to one in 10 calls in 2018. So the government's, uh, even the government, federal government's psychosocial hotline recorded 37,709 calls between April and September 2020. And more than half of them were related to emotional uh, distress, worsened, of course, and exacerbated by the current pandemic and MCO. So we, this basically paints a very clear picture of, I think, the deterioration of mental health, the effects of COVID-19 on mental health in our country. Yeah, back to you, Ivan. All right, that's a very insightful question. Uh, sorry, a very insightful answer uh, from Dr. Kelvin Yee. Thank you for that. Okay, so next, uh, a question to Dr. Ng. So what is the link between um, mental health and COVID-19? Okay, uh, I need to clarify here, mental health is not mental illness. Huh? Mental health is mental health. Mental illness is a different part of the, the spectrum, the, the uh, more severe spectrum of mental health issue. So um, even if it's normal to, to feel, uh, it is normal and understandable to feel, uh, experience fear because of the pandemic COVID-19. Yeah, it is a normal experience when there's a threat, when there's a tiger in front of us. Yeah, and COVID-19 is something real. So it is understandable and it is normal to feel a certain level of fears and worries. Um, what what are we fear about? We fear about contracting the virus, of course. Number one, we fear about contracting the virus. Number two, widespread social isolation. We are not interacting as much as before. We don't have like a meeting. We don't have this social gathering. We, we can't uh, gather together and talk about our issue. We don't have a lot of recreational activities. Yeah, last time we used to have marathon, coaching marathon. Yes, coaching marathon. Last time we used to have that. I like marathon, but now because of the the, the pandemic, a lot of recreational activity is uh, dramatically reduced, and even was prohibited due to the strict SOP that was implemented. And of course, uh, because of the social isolation, there will be a lot of feeling of loneliness. Yeah loneliness because we are not connecting to each other so this may link to this may be able to link mental health to COVID-19 and then the, the most important one is the job loss yeah job loss and financial insecurity yeah yeah so so these are the potential link that we can see uh, between uh, COVID-19 and mental health issue. Yeah. So some example of mental health issue that we heard, like what YB has said just now was suicide. 
Yeah, people died by suicide. The distress call due to the suicidal ideation has been increasing. Yeah, and other things are uh, trouble sleeping. People experience troubles in sleeping, trouble eating, increased alcohol and substance abuse, worsening of chronic condition due to worry, and worsening of their pre-existing uh, mental health condition. We have a high risk group, uh, Ivan. High risk group. This group are those with pre-existing mental health issue like those with anxiety, depression, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. COVID-19 is something about cleanliness, washing hand, yeah? washing hand, social isolation. So those with this, uh, this in the, uh, those people in this high risk group, they are more prone to suffer from mental health issue or mental health related issue due to the pandemic. Yeah, that's what the link we can see between mental health and COVID-19. Of course, individual factor can also affect uh, mental health, not only the pandemic itself contributing to the mental health issue, their pre-existing issue, the pre-existing psychosocial issue, like their psychosocial issue, like their, their uh, economic background, financial background, the family institution background the pre-existing issue also can be worsened by the pandemic. Yeah. And then we also know even the pandemic has been some time. It's been there for some time. So we are fighting and fighting and fighting to a certain level. We feel stressful. We feel that whatever we are doing, we feel out of control. Yeah. This is a normal feeling that everyone is experiencing. Yeah, that's it, yeah, Ivan. Mm, all right, that's a very, um, very good answer to ponder upon. Thank you for that, Doctor. Um, so for the next question for Ms. Charlene, um, a very simple one. Um, so let's say I am staying at home and I feel lonely and isolated. So what can I do to, um, to fix that or to make me feel better, Miss? Okay, thank you for that question. I think um a lot of us are going through that situation can um you know we are like how long already has it been the mco that we a lot of us are staying at home keeping trying to not go out so again like what dr boon say it's very normal it's normal to feel stressed especially when you know all of us think that we um we feel, we think that we are stuck at home we are interacting less with people and Again, especially when, you know, it's added to that underlying stress of worrying whether you will catch the virus. Now, like with this Delta variant, and then, you know, you hear all this news saying that it's like airborne. Then, you you know, like your mother, your father, your auntie telling you all this WhatsApp, or you even get the WhatsApp messages, right? That say like, oh, don't go here, don't go there. This person have it, don't, don't make this. The whole compound, so you cannot go. So I think... Again, number one, like realize that it's normal la, that to feel to feel this wor this feel worries. And when you feel worried, you don't want to go out, it's very normal to feel lonely and isolated. So um I think one of the biggest research that 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 did on, on depression, we 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 found that you know keeping yourself active, exercise. Doctors always recommend exercise because that has been found like one of the the best way actually to combat um, mental health uh, problems actually. So staying active. Um, I know that with the last phase, we're not allowed to go out, um, but you know, we can be creative. You know, I think we also need to um, see the silver lining. A lot of times we think that, uh, you know, I can't do anything, government say cannot, 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 but I think we need to find also the silver lining. COVID-19 has taught us to be flexible, to be creative. So stay active doesn't mean that I need to go out and run or I need to go and, you know, go cycling and stuff or play badminton with my friends. There's so many things that we can do. Can't we can do, um, we can Google Zumba on Facebook or um, having group workouts with our friends on Zoom. So that leads me to my next point, which is we need to stay connected. In this time, it's very easy to feel that, you know, we don't have friends. We, don't, we can't see each other. A lot of us have not met our friends in what, how many months? So um, try, try to push yourself to think about how to connect in un, untraditional ways. So I think WHO also have realized that their mistake in naming it social distancing um, and they've changed it to physical distancing. So we can stay connected online. 
you know, through texting, through FaceTime, through Zoom calls. I think nowadays you guys are more techno savvy than most of us. You know, that's like what that TikTok challenges. You know, you can tag your friend to do this um, workout challenge, or you can do like a TikTok duet. You know, all these MH, uh, you know, the Malaysia Airlines uh, announcements that I've seen on on Instagram. So all these kind of things uh, you can do and stay connected with your friends. Um, other things that you can do is, you know, find something meaningful. When you find something meaningful, you feel like your life has purpose. And I think just now, you know, we talked about suicide. A lot of times people feel uh, suicidal because, you know, they, they just don't feel connected anymore. That's their last resort. So find something meaningful that, that you, you used to enjoy or something to give back to the community. I think nowadays we've got like a bandera, uh, bandera Puteh movement, there's Kuching Food Aid that really needs volunteers. Um, if, if that's something that, you know, is too much for you, small things like planting, you know, something meaningful. Lah. Um, other things I think which a lot of us, if you Google, you can find lah, like um, healthy distraction, Maybe you can exercise or if you like cooking. I think in the last MCO phase, a lot of people were crazy about this Dalgona coffee, which I have not tried. <laughs> so things like that, you know, you can find. and and um, Or this is the time where you can uh, catch up on that reading, that book that you never read, that, that uh, emotional comfort book that you bought like 10 years ago, but you never touch. So probably this is, this is the time for you to, you know, um, dive into all these kind of... Uh, forgotten hobbies uh what are things find sources of comfort a lot of times you forget you know we've been disconnected for so long already but we do have sources of comfort be it your friend be it your family again being connected to each other uh and i think i would like to end um with uh the most important one self-compassion yeah um, if you find yourself saying things like, I shouldn't be feeling this way, or you're pushing away all these difficult emotions, it will only make your loneliness um, stronger. Yeah. And so instead of, you know, trying to um, avoid feeling lonely or resist these emotions, maybe it will be easier for you to just accept it as coming and going. You know, loneliness is not going to be forever. COVID is not going to be forever, even though we don't know when it's going to end. So this will take, you know, this will help take away that power and ease our unhappiness. Hmm. All right. You can okay. clean the room as well, Shalene. Uh, mess cleaning. Spring <laughs> cleaning. Yeah. I think a lot of people are doing that. If, if you want to. Rearrange the furniture. If you want to practice that, uh, my house can uh, uh, deserve some cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> Paint the house. <laughs> Do some gardening. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for the very, you know, very inspiring answer, uh, Miss Charlene. So let's go back to YB. So, right. how how does mental health issues affect education? You know, and the performance of uh, secondary school and even university students. Oh, uh, thank you so much for the important question. Again, I think uh, I, I really love hearing from Dr. Ng and also Charlene. Sometimes when you hear from mental health experts, you somehow feel better after a tough day. <laughs> but then uh, I think back to, again, back to the question, how does it affect? I think, uh, I, I mean, we, we all experience this. I think seeing um, if you many parents see their children uh, um, have to adapt suddenly to changes in the whole education system, changes in the whole curriculum, where suddenly uh, children are not allowed to go to schools, children are not allowed to, to attend physical classes, physical classes, meet with their friends, and everything is done on a home base uh, uh, capacity in front of your screens. So again, uh, this, in my view, is another huge issue that we are facing in this COVID, not just health, not just the economy, but I think we have a whole lost generation of students that are not getting a whole comprehensive or holistic uh, learning experience because education is not just about books, not just about lectures, but it's about social interactions with your friends, uh, learning experience uh, by by mixing around. So this is something that our primary school students, our secondary school students, and even uh, 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 university students are, are, are experiencing. 
and and we know with with uh, heavy workload sometimes in universities, I think more and more students are, are, are in my view they are seen as even possible a vulnerable population because they go through high levels of anxiety, uh, a lot of depression in schools due to peer pressure, due to study pressure, uh, substance abuse, um, even uh, uh, with social media era nowadays, all kinds of uh, uh, self-image issues uh, are resulting in disorder eating, so and so forth. So so now suddenly, now there is an other exacerbating factor, which is the whole radical changes of the whole educational experience. Um, I think even for university students, uh, uh, no clear direction, no comprehensive blueprints or education framework during this pandemic. Imagine, I know a lot of students suddenly get stuck in the university, not knowing whether are they online classes, can they leave their campus and then go home, or suddenly they're being told uh, one thing next day, it changes all the time. And so all these anxieties, all these uncertainties adds on to the, to, to the uh, uh, mental stress that a lot of students have to go through. And, and, and I've spoken to many young people and uh, a lot of them feel, especially during this pandemic, more anxious, stressed, isolated, and, and, and something that is very common is a lot of them lose motivation to study. And this is not just among university level, but also primary and secondary. Because suddenly, um, I mean, education is a whole, uh, it's, a, it's an experience. It's not just the books, and I've mentioned this many times. So, so, so there is a, there is a, a gap between those that 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 can uh, uh, go on online to study and those that cannot. Uh, I'm not talking just about rural or, or, or urban. I'm also talking about the poor and the rich, and and my concern, especially those that cannot cope with with uh, 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 this home based learning, is that once they go back to school, eventually, once we resume to some form of normal norm, normalcy, um, they cannot catch up with their studies. And once they cannot catch up with studies, they, they lose motivation. So I cannot put, I cannot, I, I, I cannot, my friends are way ahead. I'm stupid and stuff like that. So this actually adds on to the stress. And that is why um, uh, with all this, actually recently uh, there was a news article I read that was very heartbreaking. I think it was in UNTM Kedah, uh, where it was reported there was a death of a student, um, allegedly, allegedly due to stress uh, rushing for assignments and articles and, I mean, and, and, and exams and so, and so forth. So, of course, that case is still under investigations. Uh, but I think the main thing is it, it, affects, it affects all aspects of our life. And uh, even our students, just because they are young, do not, do not think that they are not affected by, by this pandemic, they're not affected with mental health. So this is where I think we all play a part to support one another. I think uh, we always say this whole society Thing. That means that each and every one of us need to even check out on our friends, call out, even talk to our, if we have children, talk to them. How are you feeling about this pandemic? How are you feeling about studying at home? How do you feeling about not meeting your friends in school, not going to school and play with them? I think all this, uh, we need to be there to be supportive to them. So, so to help one another get through this. I think instead of uh, moving towards a, a toxic uh educational environment, which I'm very concerned, especially in the university level where peer pressure is becoming uh, is becoming more negative than positive. But let us change that trend. I mean, instead of, 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 of condemning and judging and, and pressuring people to live up to certain standards, let us have a more uh, a supportive, loving and empathetic environment even in our schools. So I think that, be that begins with you and I. So uh, with that, I encourage you all and uh, back to you, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you, YB. Yeah, so I, I feel like that's a very relatable question uh, and a very helpful answer from YB for most of our viewers and for myself as well being, a, being in college. So for um, the next question, let's go back to Dr. Ng. So um, doctor, you know, with you having actively promoting mental health at your workplace through various programs with, you know, uh, government and NGO uh, agencies. So how can mental health be promoted yeah good question okay um i i like promoting i like talking uh, for information i i like to talk yeah if i talk i uh, usually when i give a talk i will tell people one hour is not enough for me so they say they give you two hours no no two hours is still not enough the moment i hold the mic i won't stop talking so that's uh, dangerous about me mental health is actually anytime and anyway, within four of us here, 
in the screen, there's mental health. Yeah. By believing each other, I won't say bad thing about Charlene. Charlene, believe me, I won't say bad thing about Charlene because we are working together. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, 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 I can control myself. Uh, I, I appear appropriately in a social situation. This is mental health, okay? And mental health is across lifespan as well. From the baby, from the infant, we have infant mental health. We have geriatric mental health. So mental health is actually across the lifespan. Mental health occur in school, like what we said, at home, at work, in the community, and all ages. To promote good mental health, there must be an action for that an action that promotes psychological well-being. If we talk about psychological well-being, when we when we understand the concept is of uh, mental health is anyway, actually everything we do is about psychological well-being, is about mental health. So there is no one intervention that can fit every person. It must be diversified. Yeah? Some people like to listen to mental health talk. Some people like to participate in certain group activity to gain knowledge about mental health. So how does mental health look like at the individual level? So see yourself, like ourselves, we, we, we appear appropriately now. Uh, the parents, parents behave nicely, talk nicely, coping nicely. Uh, and then uh, the teacher, the teacher at, at the school, Influencer. Now we are using a lot of influencer, social media influencer, employer, leaders. These are the people that serve as good role model. They are the good role model in terms of self-care. Yeah, because people follow them. So to start by of uh, promoting mental health is by individual level. These are the individual that people look at, and they are the role model in terms of self-care, in terms of their work-life balance in terms of healthy habits do, can you imagine if an influencer smoking and drinking and that is kind of promoting some bad habit so the at the individual level the influencer or that or other teachers or parents if they show a bad role model it's actually promoting bad mental health as well what about the community level i mean, actually everything that you do everything that i do with charlene and what we're doing is about mental health it's about promoting good Good, or good psychological well-being, like physical activities, sports, competition, treasure hunt, yeah? fishing competition is about patience, it's about uh, group activities, social gathering, support group, we have Gotong Royong, yeah? Gotong Royong is about community, the harmony in the community, the ability to relate to each other in a harmonious way. Prayer mass, home busy. Of course, due to the pandemic and MCO uh, restrictions, we can't gather now. Yeah? But there's always Google Meet, uh, Zoom meeting where we can collect a lot of people and they start talking. Of course, the former one will be education. This is a mental health promotion program. I, I believe so. If we are talk sense, if you are talk in the in a nice way, Shalit, maybe this is a mental health promotional activities. We can go to we use a webinar as well, the forum like this, a talk. News, promoting mental health through news, promoting mental health through film, yeah? The tech-savvy generation, yeah? Ivan, you guys, promote by produce more film, create songs. There's a lot of talents out there, yeah? You are the people that should start to promote mental health you with your own talent, yeah? Even you want to, drawing also can uh, pro promote mental health. Anything that you do, you think about mental health, think about recreation, think about interpersonal relationship, and that is mental health. So if you ask me, again, you ask me how to promote mental health, I would say mental health is every way. You just do your best. Yeah, You just do your best, formally or informally. Be a wrong model. Everyone is a mental health. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you for the very eye-opening answer, uh, Dr. M. So, um now to miss charlene so um how should we offer support to a friend or relative whom you suspect that may be suffering from uh mental health issues right i think that's a very important question because i uh, like what when we have been as well there is a lot of people going through um, mental health issues especially during the pandemic it's not that they never had before, but it's just being exacerbated and I think um, brought to the forefront. Lah. 
So, um, you know, first thing, just ask. You know, we, we can't assume what we know, what, what can help us might help other people. So I always encourage um, people to just ask because what might be helpful for me might not be helpful for you. So, um, yeah. And, and, and I think we have to also learn about your condition whenever we can, you know, be it depression or anxiety, you know, get yourself educated. What is depression? What is anxiety? What is OCD? What, what is, um, how is it like going through, you know, having suicidal thoughts every day? A lot of times we say a lot of these things uh, very, um, you know, nonchalantly without putting any thought. Like, you know, if I if I like to keep things in order, I say, oh, I have OCD, I'm OCD like that. But, you know, someone with really, really having OCD, it's not something that they like or they want to, to be to like that. So I think we have to, you know, really learn to notice what, what they are going through. Um, and, and be educated about that. The other thing, um, a lot of I, a lot of my patients say as well, they said that people who are open, who are welcoming, who are willing to listen, these are the people that they find um, refuge and they feel safe to, to open up. Yeah. You don't have to know everything under the sun. Like, to be honest with you, before I before I did my master's or before I did psychology, like I had no idea what, what everything was. But the willingness to listen, I think that's that's where you can start from first. And encourage them to get support, you know. Um, if you if you feel that what they're going through is really tough, uh, help them find support. Maybe they, they may be too scared. Like I think um, earlier before we had this forum, we were talking a lot about stigma, about how um, we don't know where to find help. So if you have the time, if you know where to look for help, or if you are willing to just, you know, call up the, the hotline for them and, and, and find out, you know, what are the SOPs, what is, you know, um, how do we get help and, you know, the process. At least you can be the person to, to share with them. Because sometimes not knowing scares us, right? So if you can help them do put in the work first, then that might help them be more open in, in getting their own help. Yeah. Uh, right. The most important thing as well, I think, is that if you know that they are um, threatening to harm themselves or hurt themselves, or if they are hurting themselves, immediately seek help. You know, don't don't think that this is your responsibility as my as a friend or as a sister or as a brother or as a girlfriend or boyfriend. I think a lot of times we feel that you know, if I'm I'm if my best friend is not going through um is going through a tough time, it's my job as a best friend to help out this friend, and and um even when they to the extent that they are hurting themselves, um please get help. You know um. That's why we are here. That's why we have mental health professionals. That's why we have hospitals. We have clinic kesihatan. We've got our um, mentaries. We've got you know NGOs supporting um, doing this service. Yeah, so that you guys don't have to take on all that responsibility. Let us do the work. You know, you just be there and be a uh, um, uh, shoulder to to lean on. And in line with that you know, take care of yourself. I know that we are all good friends. We are all good family members. We want to be very supportive. We want to be there 24 seven, but sometimes we have to also realize that we have a limit too. You know, you can't pour for an empty cup. If you keep pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring, you might not realize it, but you can actually do more harm than good. So once you find find yourself, you know, being affected, you yourself feeling down after you listen to, to that friend share all these kind of things, you feel also, you know, drained and tired. Um, you know, take care of yourself. You know, you don't have to be available to them 24-7. Um, you don't have to put yourself in danger to watch over this person. And you don't have to feel guilty if, you know, things are going well for, for you. I think some of Sometimes we, we do have people that feel that, oh, just because, you know, my friend or my, or my relative is not doing well, like I shouldn't, I shouldn't feel happy. 
I cannot feel guilty. Uh, I cannot feel happy. I, I feel very guilty about that. So remember that you're not, you're never solely responsible for another person's mental health. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the very insightful answer, um, Ms. Charlene. So we'll go back to YB. So, you know, these days we have, you know, especially youth that's been suffering from uh, mental health issues, you know, most, most of them uh, don't really want to uh, come out and, and, and look for help, whether it's because they, they feel like nothing can help them or, you know, they, they're scared or, you know, it's just they feel like they're, they're burdening uh, their friends or families. So with that, how can we destigmatize uh, mental health? Wow, <laughs> this is a tough question. Seems simple, but very difficult to answer. I think the one thing that we need to really understand is, uh, we, is, is it is okay to be not okay. I think from that being the baseline, I think then it is people will feel some form of normalcy to be okay to talk about mental health. So, so I think that is the first point I want to make in the sense that we should be openly talking about mental health. I think what we are doing tonight is a good step and then uh, we should do this more often to make it normal to talk about mental health, to make it not a taboo, not a stigma or some, some private matter that we should not speak about or mention about. But if we normalize it within our conversation, we normalize it within even our, our friends and everything, I think with that, uh, the baseline is set and says that it is okay not to be okay. Uh, I think the second thing that we must really focus on is uh, we need to educate ourselves and of course educate others. Uh, it is I, I believe in the power of uh, personal stories. So I think sometimes it is uh, it is okay for us to share our personal stories, even our struggles with mental health with people, so that maybe those people can identify and also eventually engage and, and, and share this and, and educate one another that it is okay to speak about it. It is okay to seek for support. It's okay to seek for treatment and it's okay to be not okay. And then I think another thing that even I myself am learning, uh, the fact of the matter that I, I used to reflect 10 years before this when I was in high school and the things that I used to say to different people. I mean, I, I was probably a jerk in a lot of things that I say, but now what I'm learning about is that sometimes we have to be very conscious with our language. I think uh, when we, we, we are not, in order not to make sure that mental health is not a stigma issue, let's make sure that the language that we speak carries love, care, and empathy. So for example, when you see somebody struggling with anxiety or depression, 10-year-old uh, uh, jerk me will say, ah, yeah, you're weakling, like, you're useless. Like, you. So, so these languages actually do not help. These languages will actually exacerbate or create more a pain to that person. So we have to learn to change our language. When somebody is expressing or showing signs of, of struggles with mental health issues, how can we be loving? How can our words build, not destroy? So this is how we have to be very conscious of our language uh, to, in order to normalize and also to, to make sure that stigma is not something that is very big in mental health. I think uh, the, other, the other issue that I'm, I'm very, I, I really believe in is uh, we need to how do, how do I frame this? We need to fight for the equality of mental health, mental illness and physical illness. Does that make sense? So it's like, for example, you know, I, for example, if I, if I go to, to a clinic or I go to a doctor says, hey, doctors, I, I'm having flu, I'm having fever, I'm having a sore throat. Nobody says, hey, you're useless, are you and everything. But when, when I go to a clinic and see a psychiatrist or see a clinical psychologist says, you know, I'm feeling down, I'm feeling so so low for the past two weeks, people, people say different things about you. So why is there a, 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 a different weightage given to physical illnesses and mental illnesses? Why can't we fight for so-called equality between them and then normalize what normal uh, mental illnesses is? And with that, uh, as I said just now, the, the key is empathy and compassion. I think uh, one thing that that re one of the reasons why I why I I was I said I started getting so interested in mental health issues uh, was because a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, my university attempted suicide. I mean, uh, we thank God that he's okay now. I mean, he's he, he got his support and his treatment. But that that suddenly clicked in me. 
um, I, 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 I was then, I mean, typical maybe guy kind of thing. I was, I was from a guy school. So the first reaction when I saw him at that, so I, I, I literally say, you what, 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 a, sorry, okay, I'm an idiot. Can I say that online? I, I started scolding him. Uh, but then I started to realize uh, I was not helping because I, 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 I didn't put myself in his shoes and understand what he was going through. So only with empathy and compassion and, and start to feel what they feel, then I start to feel like, you know what? Um, hey, these people, they, it's not like they, they, they choose to be in such situation. No one chooses to be depressed. No one chooses to be low or down or, or suffering for any psychological uh, uh, conditions. It is not a choice. So once you realize that it is not a choice for them, there is some level of empathy. And from there, then you feel like, you know, I need to make a difference. I need to build rather than, and, than, than to destroy that person. So, so again, it's, it's, it's choosing empowerment over shaming. Uh, we want to need to empower people that go through uh, uh, mental health. For example, if somebody is willing to share, you know, Kelvin, I'm, I'm really suffering. I really had a, a, a ideation of suicide before. You know, most of the time, sometimes even in our culture, we shame the person instead. But instead of shaming, I, I would like to suggest, instead of shaming, let's empower them. Say, you know what? Thank you for sharing with me. Thank you for your courage to actually tell me that you are going through a tough time. Thank you for that courage or tr thank you for trusting me to share what you thought about doing last night. And I, I, I congratulate you for getting through this. But let me help you uh, get through another night and let me refer you if, if needed to, to the needed support and needed help. So I think this is something that we need to, to teach ourselves, educate people around us who really have empathy and compassion. And I think the last one, um, in order not to stigmatize others, we also cannot stigmatize ourselves. Uh, we need to learn how to love ourselves as well when we feel such negative feelings. I think uh, sometimes even in the Asian culture, sometimes we, we, we stigmatize ourselves and because of it, we project this stigma towards others when people go through the same, time, same thing. So I think this is something that we need to learn to love ourselves do something that we love even when, it's, when we feel down. And then with that, we can then empathize when people go through it and we can support and love them uh, through it out. So I, I, I try my best to answer. I mean, just throwing out some thoughts on how we can destigmatize. But again, let's normalize the conversation. Let's fight for equality between mental and even physical health. And let's learn how to love the people. Uh, love thy neighbors. So I think that's the golden rule. So yeah, back to you, Ivan. Thank you, uh, YB. That's a very, very touchy uh, answer. And you know, I hope those uh, that are watching really absorb the mess, really absorb the message that you know it's it's okay to uh, not be okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll pass um, the next question to Doctor An. So, what are some warning signs to look out for uh, that our mental health is getting out of control, and should we consider consulting a professional then? Yeah. Thank you, Ivan, for the question. Actually, everyone experiences certain level of anxiety, yeah, and distress and depression or depressive symptom at certain time of our life. Even we, the mental health professional, mental health service provider, we do have our downtime. I do have my anxiety, my stress, my depressive symptom, my depression. It's not a clinical syndrome of major depressive disorder. What I'm telling you is like what Dr. Kelvin is saying. It's okay to feel certain emotions sometimes because it's natural. Our body naturally will launch the defense mechanism like antibody. We, our body have certain type of antibody against stress as well. When we are stressful, we are depressed, we are anxious, the normal mechanism will start to be launched. Like you start to listen to song, you, 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 you talk to friends, you watch a good movie in Netflix, you know, you go for fishing, you, you just sleep. You know, some people like to sleep and like to sleep when they are stressful. So usually the normal stress, the normal mental health issue usually are time limited, time limited and is this situational best. There's a trigger, you feel stressful. When the trigger is removed, you get better. And usually the normal stress is within our ability to cope, which is our uh, defense mechanism that uh, I was saying just now. However, when the symptoms are prolonged, one is the durations. 
the duration of the mental health issue or duration of the mental health symptoms. The second is you think you cannot cope anymore. You think it's beyond your coping mechanism anymore. It's time to seek for help. Some of the warning signs, if you are exposed warning signs, one is prolonged sadness. The sadness is not related to the initial trigger. If you are jilted by your boyfriend or your girlfriend, after you settle, after the, the, the period of time, gone like one or two months, you're still feeling sad, but you blame yourself. You started to have suicidal thoughts. The sadness is still prolonged. That one is a warning sign. Yeah. Number two, you may have some, uh, you may see people have some disorganized behavior like talking to self, like wandering around the town endlessly. Uh, this is dangerous. It's not more normal warning, this is dangerous sign. The third one is important, our sleep. Biological function, we call it biological function is affected. Biological function is eating, sleeping. Yeah, These are the biological function. If it is affected, then it's time to seek help. It is a warning sign. Recurrent panic attack. These are also important. Panic attack becomes so, so common now. We are actually receiving a lot of patients with panic attack. If you ask people around you, they have panic attack. But panic attack, like I said, panic attack is not equal to panic disorder. If you want to diagnose a mental illness or mental disorder, please come to us. We will help you to diagnose. Okay. The next one is thought of harm to self and others. Yeah aggressiveness either you become very irritable for very minor reason become very irritable and that is actually a warning sign unusual experience like voice hearing you've heard someone talking uh, condemning you asking to do bad thing do this do that abnormal belief you believe people want to harm you or the last one is of course neglecting yourself when you think that you have neglect yourself in terms of your social academic your family or you are neglecting the people depend on you like your family member these are actually an important warning sign to tell us that hey i think you need to go to look for some help eh? looking for help we've discussed just now first self-help help yourself second look for people around you that are familiar and the last one is look for professional help okay these are the some of the warning signs if you want to talk about the warning sign Every mental health issue can be a warning sign if it is exceed the duration, prolonged duration, and if the severity is increasing without showing any sign of reduction. So that's mean our normal coping strategy has failed. That's the time that we need some help. That's it, huh? Evan. Mm. Thank you for the answer, uh, Dr. An. It's very uh, yeah, very insightful, very helpful for those um, watching. So, yeah, next question for me, Charlene. How can uh, mental disorders and substance abuse be prevented during the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think we have talked a lot, you know, about coping and, and a lot of times um, we resort to things that that is helpful. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes substance is helpful at that point of time. You know, it helps us, you know, release the stress. Um, it helps us feel more relaxed. But I think um, we have to, to, to be aware as well, you know, what will be helpful in the long run? What is safe? You know, COVID-19 pandemic has a major effect on everybody you know most of us are going through challenges that are stressful overwhelming that cause strong emotions within us and i think something that um as we are having this discussion i i think of another emotion that we always for that has that we actually experience but not talk like uh not talk enough is grief you know we lost all this sense of normalcy what was life before? We don't know when it will come back. So this is actually a lot of loss. A lot of us are feeling loss. And it, it, you know, when we talk about grief, sometimes we think about death, but actually it doesn't have to be death. It is anything that we lose, you know, it can be something tangible or intangible. So, um, yeah, I acknowledge that you are actually going through all these um, tough, tough emotions. So I think number one, and this is something that we talk 
talk a lot already just now, you know, acknowledge, acknowledge that you are struggling, acknowledge that it's tough, you know, and, and that's why when you acknowledge that only then your brain can start thinking, so what can I do next? If I know that I'm having, um, if, if I'm aware that I'm having uh, some, some difficulties, then what can I do next? So first step is always acknowledge and recognize. So, so then, you know, self-care and healthy coping is very important. Um, people, like I said just now, we go to, um, we, we, we seek substance because that is helpful, but it may not be the best or the most healthy um, way. So again, it's okay not to be okay. Take breaks. You know, if you need breaks, take it. Take care of your body. We talk a lot about mental health, but we also need to take care of our physical health. If we sleep well, we eat well, we exercise, most of the time we can mitigate all these um, mental health challenges and make time to unwind. You know, you asked uh, YB just now about, you know, the effect of COVID on, on, on education. We're always, you know, we're getting a lot, we're being bombarded with a lot of assignments, you know, next assignment, we need to think about exams. Make some time for yourself, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes. If that's not enough, you know, 30 minutes, I'm sure we can spend 30 minutes to unwind, to, to um, take a break from, from the screen. Uh, I really don't know how you guys go through, go through uh, classes, you know, for, for so long, for, for hours. I myself, um, listening to webinar, well, uh, I, I don't think I can, can last more than an hour. My mind will be here and there, here and there. So notice the script that, that you have in your mind as well, in your head. Are you bullying yourself? You know, um, if you're noticing that, can we, can we say something nice to ourselves, kind to ourselves? Can we be compassionate? And I think, you know, as 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 human beings we we look for people for support so be smart about who you who you hang out who you connect with maybe it's good to connect with people that encourage healthy habits rather than yeah the not so not so healthy ones hmm. Hmm. it's a very very great and yeah uh, great answer from miss charlene yeah, so let's go back to YB. Um, a bit of a more technical question for you here. Um, the UN has recommended three broad policy actions to mitigate the global mental health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what sources of evidence uh, that were available pre-pandemic that may be particularly relevant to guiding uh, these implementations of these recommendations in low resources setting? Huh, wow. Well. Tough question there, Ivan. I think uh, basically the UN came up with uh, recommendations, uh, especially a paper, basically a policy uh, recommendation regarding the impact of, uh, of COVID-19 on, on mental health and as well some policy direction on how countries can respond to it. I think this is something that I think even in Malaysia recognize the importance of it. Uh, we cannot leave this silent pandemic unanswered if not the long-term effects of it may be even more destructive, if I can say, uh, in terms of productivity, in terms of a lot of things on the long term, so, so that, than COVID itself. So, so I think uh, just to give a very nutshell summary of what the UN, I think, spoke about, I think first issue um, is they, they recommended about to, to apply this, something that we have been saying all the time, to apply a whole society approach uh, to promote, to protect, and also to care for mental health in, in our in our country. Uh, so basically, this in what does this mean? Means that the mental health uh, aspects of things has to be a priority in our national uh, COVID nineteen response plan. It shouldn't be an additional afterthought. It shouldn't be a, a additional program, but it should be a part of the whole national. Uh, recovery plan, uh, for example, in, 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 in providing necessary supporting and uh, learning, nurturing environments uh, for children, as I mentioned, as education, children and, and young people who are confined at home, who cannot go to schools and stuff like that. 
So the recovery plan is not just about coping with COVID or, 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 or mitigating COVID, but it must provide a support system for those affected by this. So, so, so there has to be a lot of proactive policies to make sure that, that mental health is given a priority in, in the recovery uh, aspects. So besides, besides children, I just, something just occurred to me. Another, another very important uh, aspect of mental health that we, we are seeing increase during this pandemic is uh, uh, the anxiety and stress suffered by abused uh, spouses. Uh, one, of the, one of the sad things that happened during this pandemic is uh, that domestic violence has increased. And then uh, sometimes the abused are, are suddenly locked up in, with their abusers uh, for a long period of time at home. And this, of course, caused extra anxiety, stress upon them. So this, again, addressing this uh, uh, pandemic, it is important as well to be part of the whole national uh, COVID-19 recovery plan. So that is why uh, this policies has to be properly thought through. It has to be comprehensive holistics, not just on physical health, but also on mental health. Um, I think the second recommendation by the EU talks about uh, expanding the availability of uh, emergency mental health and psychosocial uh, support. Uh, this is something that I'm very passionate about. And before actually before this whole talk, I was just having an off, off record discussion with Dr. Ng and, and Charlene regarding how can we increase accessibilities of mental health in our country. For example, uh, how do we promote, they mentioned just now, mentaris, uh, programs, uh, uh, clinical sehatans, even uh, walk-ins in hospitals. How do we promote this program so that people know where to seek for help? Now, the perception again, and, and maybe to some certain extent the reality, uh, people are scared to seek for help because of the bureaucracy, because of the paperwork, and of course, uh, they, they feel such a hassle, they feel it's such, a, it's such, a, it's such so much work to, to seek for help. We need to remove obstacles, all these obstacles that is stopping people from seeking help. So, so that's why we need to expand uh, uh, this uh, men emergency mental health and psychosocial support uh, even empower uh, mental health experts like Dr. Ng and Charlene to train more, uh, to, to teach mental health uh, PFA, uh, mental health uh, psychological first aid or MHPSS uh, to, to the general public. Uh, I, I, I believe in uh, community gatekeepers. I believe in counsellors, lay, lay counsellors in every community or, or, or mental health gatekeepers uh, that can, can, can be uh, uh, that that initial point of a uh, reference per se, uh, if a certain community, a certain family member is suffering from mental conditions or, or need some support, mental health support, they could go to that person. Uh, uh, there is a there is a there is a good report uh, from a from a psycho psychiatrist in in I forgot which country was it. I think it was it Zimbabwe or something. Talk about the grandmother's bench, where where a, a psychologist. Uh, psychiatrist actually he realized he was only there was only three psychologists with a huge population of the country and he he instead chose to train uh, grandmothers because culturally the grandmothers were highly respected in the community the grandmothers were at home most of the time because they're, they're the rest are work outside in the fields working so they trained among the grandmothers with basic mental health uh, uh first aid or mental health uh, support psycho support and then they have these benches so, so since that implementation, they have seen mental health uh, uh, cases in that country drop drastically. So this is something that I believe that we should even explore on a policy level in our country, how we can expand empowerment training of MHPSS and uh, first aid, mental health first aid to a uh, lay person to have gatekeepers within uh, each community. Um, I think number three is uh, more of uh, 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 investment and I think support a greater investment into uh, mental health uh, infrastructure and system uh, for future uh, uh, issues, for future pandemics, and so on and so forth. A fact of the matter is uh, mental health is very often um, neglected, lah, even in, in national planning, even in national budget. Uh, our country, for example, spend less than 1%, um, very, less than 1% of our health budget on mental health itself. So that's, that's very low. I think almost 60 to 70% of countries all around the world uh, spend less than 2% uh, of, of their health budget, not the whole budget, health budget on mental health itself. So this is something that is, uh, imagine before this, we already had the neglect of mental health, health systems. 
the pandemic itself exacerbated. It was a stress test. It exposes gaps. It exposes uh, years and chronic neglect of mental health uh, infrastructure and mental health systems. But now in the future, how do we make sure that this does not happen again? So that is why we need to be deliberate. Countries, I mean, I mean, our country has to be deliberate in planning policies to make sure that mental health is prioritized. Mental health, and I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not just talking about nice buildings and, 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 and materials and equipments and tools, but investing in human resource, investing in more psychiatrists, uh, clinical psychologists, counselors, and the whole ecosystem uh, of, 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 of mental health to, to, to make sure that, that people uh, 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 can get support at every corner. Like when we see a community pharmacy, we can, why not see a community mental health uh, 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 spot that we can go to? So I think these are the three main things that we need to, uh, uh, the, the UN has proposed, and I think it's very relevant in our country, especially uh, activating whole society, uh, expanding our healthcare, our mental health system, and of course, investing in the future. Yeah, with that, back to you, Ivan. Thank you, Abby, for the very in-depth answer, for the very in-depth question. So moving on to Dr. Ern. So this question is, um, let's say I'm already living with an anxiety disorder. So uh, media, me media coverage can especially be uh, triggering, you know, with all the, with all the uh, news, with, especially in Malaysia. Where, where we are getting, you know, 11, 12, 13K cases this past few days with, all, with, with, with everyone sharing uh, the news uh, for that. So how can I cope best? Yeah, thank you for the question. Again, I, I would like, I, I love to normalize things because a lot of mental health aspect and mental health issue are part of a normal experience. We don't want, we do not want to sensationalize mental health disorder or mental health issue. So worry, worry, worry is a normal reaction, of course. Worry on fear of something real like COVID-19 is something very real. Can consider a normal reaction, Ivan. It can be a considered normal reaction to the actual threat. Like I said it again, COVID-19 is real. COVID-19 is real. It's not something that is not there. So usually uh, the, the worry will wax and when and then uh, sometimes it can be triggered. Yeah. Let's say if you, how to cope with it? I think the, 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 the question is very easy. The, the, the information that you have, yeah, the information that you have, you have to start to reduce the information that you, 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 you access to. You, you need to just have enough information for yourself. One is to reduce, reduce the information. Yeah. Number two, you need to learn to relax. Number two, you need to learn to relax. Number three, like Shalin said, everyone is talking about reconnect. Yeah. When we talk about uh, mental health, we need to be connected with other people. And of course, you need a lot of rest. Yeah, You need a lot of rest. And please, um, if, you, uh, if you practice your religion, if you have religion, practice your religion. And the last one, this is what we are talking about, reach out for help. So I'm actually formulating into a six R, the six R that I'm formulating. The first one is to reduce the information. The second one is to relax. The third one is to reconnect, then rest, and then religion. And the last one is to reach out. So we have been talking a lot about how to take care of ourselves, how to take care of ourselves, how to take care of ourselves. These are the, 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 the simpler version of what we were being, we have been talking about. Yeah. So, well, like I said, some, some, some people, uh, these people have a pre-existing mental disorder. Some people have pre-existing mental health disorder, like you said, anxiety disorder. Some people have their depression. Some people, they have other mental health disorder. They are considered a high-risk group. If they think that their condition is worsened, please make a call. Yeah, Please make a call and then get an early appointment. Yeah? Get an early appointment. Or just consult the doctor. The doctor, my condition is like this and like this. What should I do? Yeah, we will surely will answer you. Yes, you can do this, you can do that. Or you can come early for the appointment. The service is there. How good are you in assessing the service? If you don't know the number, you can just Google. You can get the number everywhere. Yeah, you can ask people around. You can ask your counselor. 
school counselor, college counselor, yeah, or through this platform, you can introduce, if you have a recording, if people can listen again to this, you can ask them to listen again. I can tell you, Ivan, there's a lot of webinars going on in the whole Malaysia. It's like every day I will switch on, the follow some Facebook page, I will register for this talk and register for that talk every day people are talking about mental health. So it's our responsibility, actually. Listen more about mental health. Other than listen, <laughs> other than getting information about COVID-19, something that you can't control. So control what we can control. We can control the amount of information that we get. We can control the amount of anxiety that you can tolerate. So yeah, the, the answer is just simple. Just reduce the information and uh, get more rest. Yeah, Ivan, back to you. Thank you, Doctor. An awesome answer. So let's move on to uh, Miss Charlene. So, uh, Miss, with you having uh, conducting interventions for patients across a lifespan, um, what mental health and substance use disorder interventions can be provided in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you for that question. To be honest with you, I don't think there's any difference, you know, pre or post COVID-19. Um, again, we are dealing with uh, similar things that we've already experienced prior to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, we talk about this anxiety, we talk about depression, um, all this have already been there. So to be honest with you, I, I can't think off my head whether there's any specific or different intervention for the pandemic. Um, but so what I can what I can share with you is that the evidence is there that you know pharmacotherapy, which is your medicine, and also psychotherapy, um, is very effective in helping uh, in helping um, treating mental health and also substance use disorder. Yeah, but what is different in the pandemic is that when we were forced to, you know, um, limit face to face because of this airborne kind of thing that 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 COVID spreads, we were pushed to, you know, think out of the box. So if we have to re if we cannot conduct face to face clinics, um, what can we do? So I think one thing that is different or one thing that we added into our service is providing um, teleconsultation. So that's uh, services on the phone. And we also added, um, I think a lot of my friends in private practice as well as NGOs, they already started um, providing services online. Yeah. So it's to also help with um, reducing your contact to to the virus because if you go out of the house there's definitely a risk there so that's the one thing that i can think of that is different in covid 19 otherwise what we do um what kind of treatment that we do we offer we provide is the same as before the covid 19 so um so what do we do on in this in this kind of or, or what kind of intervention what is this intervention targeting? So most of these platforms offer space for psychological support. And this is what that, you know, why we mentioned earlier before, like psychological first aid or mental health, uh, MHPSS, which is mental health and psychosocial support, you know. Um, this we have, uh, it's widely advertised. You can Google it. It's on Facebook. It's on, you know, our PPM website. Sometimes you get the message from MKN telling you about, you know, which number to call, which number to text. Um, and, and basically what, what we do in this, on, on these platforms is that to help reinforce, um, all the coping skills that you already have. Sometimes we always think that we, we forget that we have our already our own coping skills. It's just that we need some encouragement, we need support, we need reminders sometimes, you know. Um, so it's just uh, empowering empowering the person to use the skills and the tools that they've already learned and to mitigate on ongoing crisis. Again, this pandemic has robbed us of certainty. We really don't know you know, whether numbers go up or numbers come down, whether we'll be in phase two, phase three, or we're going back to phase one. There's so many uncertainties. Um, but what can we what can we do? Like what Dr. Boon say is to take control what 
is within our control. If we want to control things outside our control, then, you know, it's very natural for us to go haywire. So, um, but in instances where, let's say, you know, face, uh, sorry, online may not be enough or on the phone may not be enough, we really encourage these, um, these people or these high risk to come into the clinic and get the extra help that they need. Because, you know, our priority is safety. So if let's say this online is not enough, um, we need we need to do more support. We need more. Uh, we need more. Um, our clinic are still open. We have never closed doors during the pandemic. Yeah. So I think um, I want to end with that lah. Like you know, it's it's the same. We are we are here. We just made ourselves become more accessible during the pandemic. Mm. Back to you, Ivan. Thank you so much for the answer, Ms. Charlene. I hope the viewers um, took note of that. So with that, we have uh, we have come to our Q&A session from the floor. Um, yeah, we do have a few good questions from the audience here. Um, a few hard questions, a few okay questions. Maybe the hard questions I'll throw to YB, who knows? Yeah, all right. So hmm, let me see. Okay, so this one question from Mizan Chia. It is hard these days to decide when I'm being rational and when I'm not. I withdrew from the outside world to feel a sense of security. Will life return to normal uh, post COVID-19? I'll give that question to YB. YB? Uh, you should give it to the doctors, the Dr. Ng or clinical psychologist. Yeah, yeah sure, if you insist. Um, so doctors, a doctor or Ms. Shalim, which one of you would like to get that? I I think we, we me and Charlene will will we'll try to answer. Hopefully, we'll get the A for this answer. First <laughs> yeah. of all, I don't understand the question. <laughs> it's uh, a really tough question, huh? And I, I I can read the question. How to decide, decide when I'm rational and when I am not. Uh, Mizan Mizan, you are rational. Uh, most of us are rational. Hopefully, uh, don't be too critical on yourself. Like Charlene said, self compassion, self affirmations, yeah. A lot of our life experience are actually within normal range, especially during this pandemic. Yeah, uh, listen to your thoughts. Listen to your thoughts. Be mindful of what is happening in your mind. Yeah? Be mindful of what happening in your mind. If your mind is saying saying things negative to yourself, please S T O P stop and rethink again. And think about something that will serve soothing, like um, do something that soothes yourself, like listen to music, watch a movie, go and take a hot bath, hot chocolate, go order uh, grab food, you know, Starbucks, like Charlene likes Starbucks, I know. So drink a, a hot, hot meat, chocolate uh, or, or tea, green tea, just to relax, you know. So I, you withdraw yourself from the outside to feel a sense of security. I think this is, everyone is doing that now. Huh? Mizan, this everyone is doing that nowadays because we we want to first it is an SOP movement control this is an MCO so we need to follow the SOP strictly and will life return to normal post COVID we don't know Mizan we don't know whether life will be returned to normal after COVID these are the things that we cannot control so focus on things that you can control if your students control what you can control is you can study the amount that you can afford spend time with family spend time with friends these are the things that you can control control the amount of anxiety that you have control the amount of information that you can tolerate so these are the things that you can control so uh, Charlene, you can add if you want to have a full mark for this question yeah i think Mizan, um it is very normal to feel that way again what we talk about in this forum is that you know these are abnormal times nobody expected the pandemic nobody even expect the pandemic to last this long and yeah whether or not we're rational or not that's just how our body is coping our mind is trying to cope with all these uncertainties and when you know things get too much too too overwhelming it a natural response for us to seek our comfort. And you know, as, as kids, what do we do? We hide under the blanket, right? 
So it's very normal for us now to redraw from the outside world because it's so scary outside. Nowadays, you know, with the Delta variant, la, next thing you know, got Lambda, Theta, Marvel version, or, or you know, all that kind of thing. So it's very normal for you to, to withdraw, to, to keep yourself safe, to look for safety. Yeah, At home now is the safest place that you can be. Um, of course, a disclaimer, like if, if you know you are in a, in a very loving and, and, and healthy environment without abuse. So um, redrawing from the outside world, because maybe I'm, I'm just assuming that it's because you feel safer at home. And again, like what Dr. Ng said, whether life returned back to normal, who knows, you know? For all we know, life would be better post-COVID, yeah? We can never turn back time. We only get more experiences. We become older, we become wiser. We have, we, we, we get more experiences. So again, like um, I mentioned just now, we look for the silver lining some, uh, and, and hopefully, um, yeah, life might be even better after COVID-19, yeah. Wow. Well, that's that's the perfect answer, A plus for you both. Uh. But I just want I just want to add in like, I think Mizan is okay, and and it's it's normal to feel that way. Just because you don't feel, you don't feel great, does not make you abnormal. I think we all go through this, and then uh, just to maybe even manage certain expectations. I think a lot of people I speak to says, Kelvin, when will we have? When can we go back to normal after COVID nineteen? I think maybe uh, one of the best way is for us to even manage our expectations. Uh, we and, and and it's okay if we don't go back to normal post COVID nineteen, but we make we make do. We we dance in the rain. Uh, we we enjoy. We be creative with that new normal that we may see. Because the reality is, I think a, a lot of scientists are starting to agree that that COVID will be with us uh, for a prolonged time. But this is not a doomsday kind of announcement. But let's be creative. Let's learn how to dance in the rain. Let's learn how to to tap into things that maybe we would never do if COVID was never around. So let's be creative, let's be positive, let's be optimistic, and I'm looking forward for a new normal that we're going to be in. So yeah, back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. A++ for all three. Yeah, okay. So let's um, look for uh, more questions. There's one question from Dexter Tope. So how do we deal with mental exhaustion or burnout? Uh, even though we are at home most of the time, we tend to feel exhausted due to the constant repetition. So I think I'll throw this question over to Miss Sherilyn. Can then after that again, you know, feel free to jump in, uh, YV and Dr. Ng. How do we deal with mental exhaustion on burnout? I think again, you know, realize that it's normal. You guys are even though you guys are at home. I think I can say that you guys are working way harder than before. You know, uh, just because you're at home, sometimes people assume that you know you have all the time in the world to do more assignments, to give, to be, to be thrown at doing more work. So it's normal to feel to feel that way. Uh, and I think when because you're asking that, you're aware that you know you're at that tip, you're at that you you're at that point where you know it's too much already so take a break you know uh what what is the 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 cause of your of your burnout or your exhaustion is it too much screen time is it too much class is it too much uh too much work that you're doing so take a break you know walk around um stay active maybe put on like a 30 minute or 15 minute YouTube workout or the Zumba, or if you've got a garden, you know, go out, smell the air, you know, um, look at the greens. If you don't have it, you have a window that you can look outside. And and sometimes you might you might be surprised that you you never notice how your view has been until you open the window and look. Yeah. Maybe this um again. COVID has taught us to be, to be creative or has pushed us to be more creative. Maybe last time you used to go to, you know, you used to um, 
go for massages, go for spas, or go to Starbucks, or you know, go and travel, uh, go to um, the, the waterfall. But maybe we can do something else. You know, that doesn't have to be the only way we, we take a break. You know, push yourself. You Google. Yeah. Anything else to add, Dr. Dr. L? Maybe, maybe I jump in a little bit and, and let Dr. Ng do like the mind blasting punchline right at the end. Uh, I think, I think I mean, it's, it's not much, it's, it's very similar to what Charlene has said, but something that I myself learned how to deal with all the exhaustion, the frustration, uh, the occupational hazards that I have to deal with being a public figure, but it's uh, learning how to love yourself and learning how to do something that you love. I mean, the, the general term is self-care. Uh, find something that makes you happy to do. I think it's the simplest of things. It can be playing computer games. It can be planting a plant and see it grow. I tell you, I have, I have, I have really black fingers. I can't grow a single plant. But trying something new, but maybe even putting a, a cactus and then seeing it grow, that gives me some sense of accomplishments and it makes me happy. Like, 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 like I cannot describe. So maybe find something that. Either you are good in and then you do to make it happy or find something that you're not good in and try to make yourself better. And there is some sense of accomplishments in that. So find things that make you happy. I met Marie Kondo. Find something that gives you joy. I think that that, that it will help you through this time. So to Dr. Ng for the punchline. You're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw. I, my answer is easy. If you want activity, please Google activity to be done during lockdown. So you can see a long, long list of activity. And please do one by one and enjoy it. Yeah. So I hope that answer that question, Ivan. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Um, here's a question from David Christopher Smith. Oops, it's the wrong question on screen. Uh, but that's a good question by Phoebe Sia. I think it's a very important question to address okay. Dr. Ng and Charles Charlene. Yep. I'm like pushing it to you guys, I'm sorry. Why be avoiding all the questions? It's all right. Yeah, I'm I think this is hours, I'm empowering both of them to answer. <laughs> yeah, so Phoebe, Phoebe, you're asking that how do I get a friend to open up if he's not someone who's willing to talk about his feelings? Um, I hope you guys don't mind that I jumped in. Um, you know, it's hard. Like what I think that is why you know uh Segi has uh, has has organized this talk. Mental health is not something easy to talk about. It's very taboo. It's stigmatized. You know, if you say that you're you're depressed or you're anxious, people first thing say like, you xiao wana," you know, um, because people don't understand. And so, when you are experiencing or when your friend is experiencing these kind of emotions, they might be scared. So, you know, it's okay if they're not ready to share. I think. Um, we, we can only help to a certain extent. But tell that person that you are there, you, you are willing to listen when he is ready, when he or she is willing to, to, to talk to you. Yeah. So at least he knows, you know, that if I need someone, if I'm ready to talk to somebody, that I know that, okay, I can contact Phoebe. Yeah. The the I think to, to summarize what Shalin was saying is to, to be with them. Mm. To be with them emotionally. Yeah, if even if you don't have time for that, you can say I, I'll be with you until this time. I'll sit here, I'll do my thing. If you think you want to talk, if you're ready to tell me, I'm ready to listen. Yeah. If you think this has been some times already, you may want to suggest something like uh, I know I know Miss Charlene in GH and she's good and uh, maybe I can accompany you to see her or make an appointment. Is that something that you are thinking as well? Yeah, ask questions like that. Um, just being with them is not easy to have like a mental health issue, like all the taboo, all the stigmas, 
all the fear or the insecurity that they are having yeah Sim simple simple advice like um um take care of yourself you know people around you is here for you you just feel free to say anything that you want yeah i think that that will that that is enough nah. Yeah, just, so just to then jump. back to yeah Sorry, back to I, be, I know you want to answer something <laughs> no no finish finish your thing finish, finish i thought you're done sorry sorry my apologies no, i think, I, think uh, I i i fully agree with uh, uh charlene uh, so dr Ng. i think it's important we learn how to hold space for our friends and what does that means means to be there for them uh sometimes uh I, and i'm guilty of this and a lot of times Sometimes we are problem solvers. When we see a friend with a problem, what we want to do is just to solve their problem. And then, you know what, force, you know, just tell me, just tell me, let me solve your problem. And that does not help. Sometimes we need to learn how to hold space. You know what, just, just a simple act of being there and also having silence, but they knowing that you are there, that actually will help a lot. So sometimes you cannot force, you cannot press things out of people, but holding space in a sense that, you know what, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not abandoning you, uh, uh, but I'm here. And the day you want to speak about it or the day you want to seek help, I'm walking with you. I'm going with you. I'm not judging you. I'm normalizing what you go through because I know when I am going through it, you will do the same to me. And I think that gives a certain level of empathy, compassion, and then to the whole conversation. So again, uh, I have to learn it. Let us not try to be problem solvers all the time. Uh, let us learn how to hold space for our friends next to us. So yeah, thank you. All right, very good answers from uh, all the panelists. So let's move on to uh, maybe two more questions. Yeah. So this one question from Hazy: How can mental health services be made more accessible, especially in states of like Sarawak, whereby many rural areas are pretty isolated with limited infrastructures that could permit them to seek help? I'll pass this question off to YB for obvious reasons. No, I would love to hear from Dr. Ng and, and oh, okay. I'll give the summary of what I think, but I'd love to hear from them first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Avoiding every question. Okay, uh. okay. sure. That's okay. Right. <laughs> Empowering There's a Tai Chi also. happening. <laughs> There's a Tai Chi <laughs> happening inside. I can feel it. I can feel it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Politician, right. I always expect. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I went actually. Um, to answer this, actually, the 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 the, uh, the mental health services or the psychiatric services, they are expanding um, over the past few years with uh, small places like uh, Limbang, um, Lawas, Kapit. They have started the psychiatric services. So how to promote? We are talking about step care model. Step care model, of course, the the at, at the lower pyramid. We want to train more community level, like what YB said, lay counselor. We want to reach out to them. Uh, back in the place that I worked before, um, there's one ministry, uh, Jabatan Pembangunan Wanita, I think. They are actually training lay counselor from the offices. Uh, they are training lay counselor from the, the public as well, whoever interested uh, to become, we call it para counselor. They can come to a two days workshop. These are what we want. We train the, 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 the community to be the frontliner. Uh, the, the magic word of 2020 and 2021 is frontliner. So we want more frontliner in mental health. Yeah. We want more frontliner in mental health. The, the frontliner, the para counselor that know when to refer to the upper level of the pyramid, which is a mental health professional or clinic kesihatan, and eventually to a psychiatrist, the specialized psychiatric services. So of course, we want the community to be able to manage themselves to reduce the referral. So when they come to psychiatric services, we usually we, we need some kind of medication or specific type of a psychotherapy by clinical psychology. So if you ask, ask me to answer this question, I think we are going into that phase. We are going into that phase. Yeah. So Charlene, can you add more so that we can get another A++ for our question? I would add to that is continue to call Dr. Boon and provide more more uh, training 
But I think like what Dr. Boon said, uh, you know, we are trying our best. Um, we know that our colleagues in rural areas, you know, with the limited resources, so we do what we can. Uh, we empower them, you know, by doing more trainings, by by doing more of these kind of talks to raise awareness. Um, and and I think, yeah, we are just doing our best to 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 cope with whatever that we ha we have lah. Maybe, but I think this is a question to be thrown back to YB. Yes, thrown back. <laughs> yes, correct. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I mean, I mean, I fully agree with what's been shared uh, on a policy level, and and I think I mentioned it in, in in my answer for the previous question in terms of moving forward. Uh, what do this country need to do in terms of focusing and also strengthening and expanding our our health mental health resources? Of course, number one, uh, like in Sarawak, uh, when I was first elected in twenty eighteen, there was only two CPs, uh, clinical psychologists in the whole Sarawak. Now we have, I think, about six. Uh, I'm talking about government service, government service about six. So, so this is a step of improvement. We need much more. And I'm not just talking about CPs. We need more psychiatrists. We need more counselors and also in the rural clinics. Okay, I'm not saying that uh, we need psychiatrists everywhere. Uh, I agree with the whole triage system in a sense that we can train uh, community leaders on, on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a more local basis. Just now, the, I mentioned about the country Zimbabwe, where, where they train grandmothers because they noticed that there were community leaders in, in their communities. So in, in, in the context of Sarawak, even in Malaysia or our city areas, we have to identify who are these community leaders that people naturally go to and then give them proper empowerment, proper training on mental health, or first aid or MHPSS. And then slowly, then they can refer eventually to uh, um, uh, higher, uh, whether it's clinical kesihatan, then to the uh, secondary hospitals, then to tertiary hospitals. So I think we, we need to expand the base and the base is more community lay counsellors and community gatekeepers. Uh, I would like to see uh, more subspecialists. I mean, uh, um, uh, Dr. Ng is probably one of the nation's uh, uh, brightest uh, child psychologist. So, so uh, he is very subspecialized in that. I think uh, we need to see more different psychiatrists taking subspecialty as well so that there is more understanding, there's more knowledge and there's more knowledge transfer even to people below. So we need to expand on our infrastructure, our tools that the, the, our, our, our mental health uh, professionals use and also of course a human resource, increase more psychiatrists, increase more clinical psychologists, increase more counselors and train more uh, laymen. So with that, to with that, for that to happen, we need of course more inf uh, resources more focus of from the national from the federal government on mental health it shouldn't be a side kick on physical health creative health is main uh, mental health okay lucky if we got extra money we give that it cannot be it has to be priority it has to be part of the whole national recovery plan and that's something that we push forward to and that has to be the policy direction that we go lah. so i hope my answer uh, gets a, hopefully a, at least a b from both of you a bunch of high achiever here <laughs> yeah all good answers um yeah okay so one last question before we wrap before we wrap things up from david i don't always seek people to fulfill my social needs but i'm just so comfortable not interacting with people at times and just want to be alone but on the other hand there are times i feel quite lonely but aren't even comfortable interacting with others it's like being stuck between not wanting to see anybody and wanting to talk with someone is there any explanation on this uh, and any way to remedy this? I'll throw this question over to Ms. Charlene. Wow, the tough one. <laughs> yeah, let me try to understand the question. Uh, okay, so I think, again, it's quite, it's quite normal, uh, you know, sometimes we just don't feel like talking to people, again, um we are social beings you know human beings we are social beings we need the connection uh we need to feel belong we need to feel loved um even though we may not need the constant talking to each other but knowing that um if i want to talk to someone there's somebody there if i if knowing that you know even though i don't meet with people that at the back of my head there's someone there there's a community there to support me um 
So it's like being stuck between not wanting to see anybody and wanting to talk to someone. So yeah, I think I think that is it. That sometimes we just need to know where we where we are, the balance. Um, you sound like someone that's quite aware of what you need. You know, too much is too much, but you also know that you do need you do need to 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 have the company sometimes. So I think it's quite normal uh, as human beings. We are social beings, but at the same time, sometimes we just too much people is yeah. Okay. I I mean sometimes I also don't want to talk to people. I just be I'm happy in my room on my Netflix, you know, or playing my game. Uh, I I I have enough of human beings sometimes. So I think that's pretty normal. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think? Uh, I mean, I, if I don't, if you allow me to jump in, I think David, uh, thanks thanks for sharing um, um, about what you go through and stuff like that. I think it's very brave of you. And, and the fact of the matter is, knowing your, how you are does not make you abnormal, or there is a need to remedy something. It's just probably the way you are. Um, I think we need to know how who who we are and what is our characteristic, what's our personality. I, you, I'm sure you heard of uh, there are some introverts, there are extroverts. And then there are even personality tests that you can they can take that you can really help uh, understand who you are and, and even your quirks and your even tendency of why you do things. Uh, there's I forgot what that personality test is. Is the ENTJ, INTJ, and everything that that actually that you can do online and it actually speaks a lot of who you are, your personality, why you react in a certain way, and what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses. I was I was I was ENTJ. And then I went to ENFP, if I'm not mistaken. So sometimes it changes. Uh, but basically, I'm, I'm generally an extrovert. So that's why you see me talking all the time. Uh, politicians are what to do. Uh, and I gain, I drain energy from being with people. So when I'm with people, I feel excited. And when, when, uh, but for introverts, of course, there are two kinds of introverts. Uh, there are introverts that I just, I just want to be alone. I, I, I feel it very difficult to speak to somebody. I feel very drained speaking to somebody so uh, so and then of course there are also the functional introverts where they may seem like an extrovert you know, so they're very very charismatic in public talking to different people speaking in, in, in different engagements but after all that they need to retreat into a room to somehow recharge so i think the difference between extrovert and introvert is where you draw energy from we are extrovert we draw energy from people um for introvert people draw their energy per se. I mean, not in a bad way. And, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. So again, um, don't always think that extroverts are good or introverts are good. It's just the way we are. It's just our personality. And, and, and the way you describe it, it's just your personality. So don't feel the need of, I need to remedy this. Uh, don't feel that you are abnormal. You are wrong. But of course, again, and as I said, just because you are the way you are does not mean you cannot challenge yourself to try something new. Just because you're an introvert doesn't mean you cannot challenge yourself. You know what? I want to stand on stage and speak to a group of people. I want to do this. I want to do that. I challenge myself. And it's okay. And you can take small steps to reach that. And, and, and I think, yeah, to you, Doctor. Okay. Um, David, if you need to talk to anyone, you this is a good chance. Uh, this is a... A good question. I, I would say this is there is no easy answer for your question. In terms of psychology, there's a lot to be explored. Why are you uh, not comfortable interacting with others? We are not talking the whole psychology inside. But if you think you need a remedy, you can try a different type of interaction. You can start a conversation, even a simple conversation. Through a new conversation, new way of relating to others, you will get a new experience, a new feeling of other. Maybe it previously you may not feel nice talking pe to people, maybe people ignoring you in the past, but not everyone is like that. Not everyone is uh, ignoring you. You can try to interact more. If you think this is something that you want to remedy, you can try to interact. Uh, that's how um, interaction create a new feeling. Yeah. If you don't like it, never mind. You can just be yourself, like Charlene said. It can be normal, something normal. Uh, if you need some someone to talk to, I think Sergey College have a lot of counselor, right? <laughs> yeah. I went back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Q, all for the great answers. Yeah. Actually, we do have uh, some counselors. Uh, you know, uh, those thingy students watching, uh, Miss Ng from Student Affairs, she's uh, one of our counselors. Yeah, so I think with that, 
um, it's been a very fruitful session, a very wonderful session with all, uh, all the panelists. I would like to thank you for your time, for your effort, uh, for your energy to, to come on and talk um, to those sitting at home, those viewing uh, this talk right now, um, and, and just indulge them in the importance of maintaining your mental health during the pandemic. Um, yeah, so you know, with that, um, but before we wrap things up, um, to, to those watching, um, we, 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 we are giving out um, e-certificates for those uh, that are viewing this forum. Um, uh, David Smith will be posting a link to a feedback form in the comments, so you guys can check that out. Uh, fill in, fill in um, the feedback form and, and you will be given your e-certificates. Those can be used in, in your, um, uh, your, to gain the student engagement points um, of, from Segi, Segi College Tara. Yeah, so I think with that, we can end things here. Uh, don't forget to check out our our next episode of Triple SRC Speaks. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. Bye bye. Thank you, Charlene. Cheers.